Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I would just like to welcome you to our Preserve uh, Minnesota 2020 continuing webinar series. Uh, just so you all know, um, we are recording uh, this uh, webinar and we will have it available um, soon on our website as soon as we can after the presentation. Um, we would hope that you put your questions in the Q&A box as they come in, and I'm going to turn it over to Sarah from our office for presentations. Great. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, John. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the State Historic Preservation Office, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 40th annual Preserve Minnesota Conference and our fourth of six virtual conference sessions. I hope everyone is safe and well. I am Sarah Beimers, the Environmental Review Program Manager with the State Historic Preservation Office, and I'm speaking to you from my home in Northfield, Minnesota, the homeland of the Dakota people. I invite you all to let us know where you're participating from and welcome you to acknowledge tribal communities as Minnesota is also within the traditional homeland of the Anishinaabe. You can do this by typing into the chat feature, click on the icon that looks like a circle with a dimple at the bottom of the screen and then enter your comment. There are at least 13,000 years of American Indian history in Minnesota. Other native nations with ancestral connections here include the Iowa, Ho-Chunk, Cheyenne, Cree, Lakota, and Assiniboine. We'd also love to hear if this is your first time joining a Preserve Minnesota conference, so feel free to type into the chat feature that you are a first-time attendee. If you were here with us in St. Cloud last year, you may have filled out an online survey regarding the updating of Minnesota's statewide preservation plan, or perhaps voted for a preservation minister or both. For this year's conference, we're going to conclude a year of engagement and forward the draft plan to the National Park Service for final approval. Or we were going to. <laughs> However, because of the pandemic, our timeline has been modified, as you might have guessed, and we have received a year-long extension to complete this plan. There are still ways to engage in this process, and a draft plan will be out for public comment in mid-2021. You can sign up for SHPO's Gov Delivery email messaging by visiting our webpage to subscribe. We've all been adjusting to the global pandemic and our virtual conference reflects those adjustments. While the SHPO team values the networking opportunities we have during our in-person events, we hope that our online series will allow for greater access and participation for the sessions scheduled during these three weeks. Thank you for being a part of this virtual conference and for joining us from your home or wherever you're tuning in. Computer screens with virtual presentations are no substitute for meeting face-to-face, -face, so we appreciate you taking the time to join us. With that, I want to welcome our speakers for this morning's session titled, Untangling Preservation Planning, From Context Statements to Conditions Assessments, presented by my colleague, Ginny Way, SHPO National Register Architectural Historian, and Tamara halverson Lutt, a historian and preservation consultant with New History. So I'm turning it over to you two now. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. John, are you available? <laughs> it's on. There. Thank you. There we go. Yep, you should have it now. <laughs> I do. Thank you very Great. much. <laughs> You don't want to see all three. Sorry. You see our title slide. We can see the whole PDF. Great. Thank you. Welcome to Untangling Preservation Planning from Contact Statements to Conditions Assessment. My name is Tamara Halverson Lute, and I am a consultant with New History, a building reuse firm based in Minneapolis. I'm trained as a historian and an architectural historian. And at New History, I specialize in our complicated state and federal compliance projects. What, that's, what this means is that I both prepare and regularly use the preservation planning documents that we'll be discussing today. I am Jenny Way. I'm the National Register Architectural Historian for the State Historic Preservation Office, as Sarah said. My role is primarily focused on the eligibility of properties through all of SHPO programs, and that re 
includes the review of preservation planning documents completed both as part of SHPO's programs and also through the uh, Minnesota Historical Society Cultural, Historical and Cultural Legacy Grants. Um, I, in addition to that, I use these documents in my everyday work to assess the significance and eligibility of properties. In addition to our roles at New History in the State Historic Preservation Office, Ginny and I co-teach a course on historic preservation at the University of Minnesota. In that course, we have found that our students benefit from our different perspectives, because while we're partners in advancing historic preservation projects, we have very different responsibilities throughout the course of any preservation planning doc project. To that end, today we'll be discussing a variety of preservation planning tools, and in addition to describing what the, each tool is and how it functions, we'll discuss how we use it in our everyday work. We recognize that we are presenting a PowerPoint about written documents. <laughs> we may not be presenting the most thrilling material that you'll cover in, in this year's conference, but what we have found through the course of our jobs is that a lot of people are really confused about what preservation planning documents do, how they're used, when they should be undertaken, and how long they're valuable. And so we feel that these are incredibly important documents to talk about. However, we also recognize that it's important to see how they make actual projects viable and how they result in successful rehabilitation projects. And to that end, we'll end on case studies that show how various preservation planning documents were essential to the reactivation of historic buildings and spaces. So we're going to look at the most common types of documents today. We're going to try to stay out of the weeds. So we're going to try to stay at a 30,000 foot level. Um, we do welcome any questions that you might have, as John said, in that Q&A function. Um, we really feel like that's going to be where the rubber meets the road and um, where we can best help you to understand what's happening um, in your situations or general questions. Um, please remember that while we are going to discuss above ground structures and landscapes today, um, Preservation is architect um, is interdisciplinary, and archaeology is just as important as standing structures, uh, especially when you do your inventory and evaluation work. We encourage you to do that concurrently so that you understand all of the resources located within any given parcel, um, and try not to to think about the standing structures and the above ground resources differently than your archaeological resources. Um, Preservation planning goals can range drastically in scope and focus, which is why some of these documents are confusing when to use them and why you need them. Um, but keep in mind that one of the key points is that formal historic preservation, which we're talking about today, um, hinges on the eligibility of a property. Generally, when you work with the SHPO, it hinges on the National Register eligibility, but can also hinge on local designation eligibility. Um, these documents, the planning documents in the beginning of the process that we're going to discuss are about determining eligibility, um, making sure that the property has significance and can support an integrity argument. And then the latter half of the document, uh, latter half of the documents we're going to discuss basically talks about how to continue to keep that eligibility during the treatment process. Um, so keep in mind that the types of information that you're trying to gather help to support that eligibility conclusion. That's the difference between a planning document and a history. So what do we mean when we say preservation planning? If you work for a city, you're familiar with a preservation plan. And a preservation plan is usually part of a city's comprehensive plan. And what it does is it identifies the community's preservation goals. It includes community engagement in order to identify those goals. It strengthens political support for preservation policy, and it plans for future preservation work. At its heart, it often also encourages economic development through the retention and rehabilitation of historic resources. So while a city develops a preservation plan as part of its comprehensive plan, preservation planning documents, like we're talking about today, they're part of a greater process of implementing those preservation goals. They follow a very specific organized sequence of preservation activities, specifically identification, evaluation, registration, and the treatment of historic properties. There are a lot of people that engage, engage in preservation planning um, from the macro level um, of the statewide preservation plan, uh, which is put together by the State Historic Preservation Office to the micro level of individual property owners that are just trying to get some work done on their building. 
um, public entities like the ones you see here um, engage typically because federal and state law requires it. Um, they can produce foundational documents, but often when it comes to these documents and the use of these documents, the roles and authority are, li are limited by the regulations. Um, private and nonprofit entities engage as stewards of historic properties and as advocates for preservation or academically, um, simply to further the understanding of a particular subject area, all of which are very important. And then private owners engage most often to take advantage of the financial incentives related to historic preservation. This is the least formal. Um, however, they have the most control over what can actually happen to a building. So these roles are often clearly defined by the program that um, a person is activated in. Um, and we engage both in the, all of these entities get, engage often both in the writing and in the use, depending on um, what the project is and how they're approaching it. Preservation planning and the tools that we'll be discussing today serve a number of functions. They're all equally important. They broaden our understanding of history, both at the local and state level. They identify potential historic resources for protection, investment, and redevelopment. And they clear the way for consistent and effective project planning. Very often in the course of my role as a consultant, I'll get a phone call from someone who's interested in buying a historic building or has realized that they've already bought a historic building and they want to understand what their opportunities and constraints are in the reactivation of that building. If preservation planning documents like those we're going to be discussing today have been commissioned and undertaken and they're available for me to use in answering those questions, I am able to help a potential redevelopment project clear efficient, a clear and efficient path to reuse because I understand whether or not a building is historic whether or not it's eligible for financial incentives of any described, whether or not it's locally designated and needs to go through a review process at the local level, and whether or not there are specific character and character elements and materials that need to be preserved in the reactivation of a building. Knowing all of that in advance of starting a project creates a far more efficient timeline to construct. This is true for the State Historic Preservation Office as well when we do our regulatory reviews. Having all of that information in place can help uh, create a solid foundation for moving forward and reduces the amount of questions that we tend to ask. Well, that we tend to ask you. <laughs> Preservation and planning is important because once historic properties have been dem demolished or destroyed, they cannot be replaced. As Jenny noted, it takes preservation planning takes place at a number of scales, from the individual property owner to all the way up to the state. There are even federal preservation planning programs. It can support other planning goals, such as sustainability, walkable cities, and economic development, and it should be integrated into a larger planning process. Preservation planning should always include public participation. The best way to get support for your preservation policies and to have clear understanding of what preservation means and what designation does and doesn't mean for an individual property is by engaging the public. As Jenny is going to note later on in the presentation, it's also, also the very best way to find out what stories and histories are important in your community to make sure that all stories are represented. As we've hit upon before and will hit upon throughout the course of this presentation, there's a logical and systematic order to the preservation planning process. So preservation planning was formalized by the National Park Service through the Secretary of the Interior Standards and Guidelines for Archaeology and Historic Preservation in 1983. The process oh. was, we lost it. I know. Sorry, folks. I'll keep talking. I think so. The, the process was divided into four basic steps, uh, identification, evaluation, registration, registration, and treatment. And generally, the documents are categorized under a single step. But as we know, preservation projects tend to be complicated and they're rarely, they rarely are undertaken um, in quite a clean as manner, a clean a, a manner as the regs had, had initially intended. Um, what's important to remember is that the documents build on each other and they work with each other to create efficiencies. However, each project in need is different. Um, for instance, if you're told you need a historic structure report and you don't know why, 
it's important to ask those questions. We work with consultants all over the country um, and they use these words and these terms, um, identification, evaluation, and the names of the documents a little bit differently um, than, than maybe we do in Minnesota or maybe we do from project to project. So if you have a question about why you need a, a specific document or what that specific document is supposed to, um, to convey, uh, do ask it, no matter what your area of expertise or how often you've worked in these projects. Um, sometimes you don't need a historic structure support. Sometimes you just need a conditions assessment. Um, talking about these things and making sure that everybody understands exactly what the goal of the preservation document is uh, will help um, efficiencies in the project and also just help better communication. Um, at a very pragmatic level, it will save resources, both time yeah. and financial. So talk about what you need, figure out why you need it. And if you don't know, ask. Um, certainly if you're working with SHPO, you're welcome to call us. Um, sometimes it's these documents are required because of grant reasons. Sometimes they're required, um, you know, because of mitigation. Sometimes they're required for all sorts of reasons. Um, and sometimes it's just what somebody thought of and maybe you don't actually need it. Not that we ever make that mistake. <laughs> Um, so the first step is identification. So um, the identification of properties, basically this information provides the research necessary to support eligibility. Um, we need to know why a property is significant in order for it to be eligible and these documents provide that foundational information. The co most common types are listed. Um, the context and theme studies are roughly the same thing. A theme in, in the case of preservation is basically a a concept in history or prehistory that that affects American um, American history. So it can be anything from an architectural style to um, an immigration system to uh, landscape architecture. Um, as I said, these are broad foundational documents and are important for um, building. So we're gonna go over context first. So uh, context are documents that explore themes within the ge a geographic or temporal limit and under specific circumstances. So these documents tie the history um, of a place and themes to specific geographic locations. Um, they're most often undertaken by mun municipalities and written by consultants, and they're not always reviewed by SHPOs. Uh, very often these are commissioned by local governments um, and they are for local government use. Um, and then we try to get copies of them so that we can, you know, be informed of their of their content and the information. Um, this is, as Tamara mentioned earlier, the greatest opportunity to create diversity and to engage with underrepresented communities to share their stories. So this is an opportunity for any entity to reach out to um, any community and their interest and ask them about about their history, about their impact on the built environment or the um, or the cultural landscape, um, and have an opportunity to really create a, a base foundational document about something other than the histories that we tend to, to focus on. Um, these documents will often list previously identified resources, but they don't locate new resources. Survey is not part of this document. Um, scopes can range from single focus resources like Fire Towers of Minnesota, 1910 to 1970. Or they can be more complicated, like the one we see here, which is the St. Paul African American Historic and Cultural Context, 1837 to 1975. Um, both of those examples have multiple themes within the context document. Clearly, the African American context is much more robust um, than Fire Tower, simply because there's much more that goes into understanding um, how that particular group of people influenced and were influenced by policy and regulation in the built environment. In the field, I use historic context and theme studies to evaluate and situate property when I'm considering whether something is eligible for local designation, national register designation, and the financial incentives that accompany those designations. Um, as Jenny said, where contexts are exceptionally important in my line of work, is that 
they provide insight into the things that I can't see in the built environment. So they tell me stories that help me identify whether or not a building that I'm looking at can represent or does represent the history that we have covered in the context. That's harder to see than say architectural style. I can't see that when I'm walking up to a building on the street. So a context gives me the framework with which to make those evaluations that are more about social history than they are about architectural history and materials. Um, when we talk about project efficiency, if I don't have a historic context for the subject um, that I'm trying to evaluate, the story that I'm trying to tell, the argument I'm trying to make, I have to develop one through the course of any nomination or evaluation. That adds more time to any project. So when contexts are available, they do create project efficiency. Um, another type of context that we have at the State Historic Preservation Office and are usually undertaken by State Historic Preservation Offices is a multiple property documentation form. I only mention this because um, while they are robust contextual documents, they also have registration requirements. So this is, um, these are requirements that clearly identify under um, the subject of the, of the multiple property documentation form on the situation under which these properties are eligible. That was a bit of a tongue twister. For instance, <laughs> this MPDF is about banks in Minnesota. It does not locate all of the banks in Minnesota. However, it has a context about bank development and about architectural styles of banks, and then goes on to describe when a bank is eligible. These are used for ubiquitous properties. Um, any town may have multiple banks. How do you do the comparative analysis to determine which, which bank in your community is in fact eligible for listing? and is the best example of a bank. Um, an MPDF tells you things like, banks that don't survive the depression are generally not considered eligible because they were not, um, they were not good business investments. Um, these documents go through the National Register listing process. So they're reviewed by our office, the State Review Board, and go on to the National Park Service for final acceptance. These documents need to be used if you have a property that falls under one of them. Um, the State Historic Preservation Office has a number of these, and you will hear from our office um, and from consultants, oh, that's covered in an MPDF. That means that Tamara doesn't have to write the context. The context is there for them, and not only that, you have specific registration requirements that need to be addressed in your evaluation documentation. Um, the next thing that we're going to look at, so once you have your context, once you sort of know what you're going out to look for, your context has given you these big swaths of, of area that may or may not be, um, may or may not be a place that you can go look for any certain kind of building or certain type of, of, uh, of property, we do a recon survey. So a recon surveys are sometimes referred to as a windshield survey. Um, they identify properties that are likely associated with historic context, and they make recommendations on the need for an intensive survey. They do not evaluate properties individually or as contributing and non-contributing elements. A recon survey does not require building specific research, and they are typically used to get a general understanding of an area. Um, the way to think about a recon survey is, is if a context has told you that mid-century modern properties are likely found at the edge of your residential um, your residential development, a windshield survey, a recon survey is when you go out and you look and you say, oh yes, this this is in fact mid-century, um, these are mid-century buildings, these are mid-century, you know, minimal traditional houses, or nope, they're still farmland, so they might have been platted um, and intended to be built, but they weren't actually, nothing was actually constructed here. Or yes, these do, these are residential houses, but they're clearly from 1980. So we probably don't need to dive deeper into their significance under, um, under a mid-century context. Um, they, they give us a little bit of a a more specific boundary, but again, they don't do eligibility discussion. They basically give you an opportunity to say, we thought something might be here, there is something actually here, and we would like to look into it a little bit farther. I often think of recon surveys as, oh, that's interesting. I want to know more about that. <laughs> and in the field, when 
where recon surveys are beneficial to me is that again, if somebody calls me about a property and it's been evaluated through a recon survey, I know whether someone has said, oh, there's something interesting there, we should dig into it. And that allows me to give advice on next steps. Uh, we sh I should note that recon surveys are typically um, undertaken by federal agencies and local, um, local municipalities. Um, and they are sometimes even funded through legacy grants. Um, so evaluation is that next step. Um, this is when a property is the significance and the integrity uh, according to the National Register criteria or the local designation criteria are analyzed. Um, evaluation documents tell us if the subject property is eligible for listing. Um, and the, the level of these eligibility, sorry, when the State Historic Preservation Office determines that these properties are eligible, it's recorded in our statewide inventory. Um, and therefore becomes a trigger for um, various other programs. Um, intensive surveys are the, the largest um, pro uh, evaluation document that we tend to see. These are designed to identify precisely and completely all historic resources in an area. Um, they involve detailed background research and a thorough inspection and documentation of the property in the field. Um, they include building descriptions, construction history, fully developed context, and analysis of eligibility under applicable criteria. They can include, they can be done on historic districts, which you see on the right, or individual properties, which we see on the left. Um, they are most efficiently completed if uh, contextual work and recon surveys have been done before the intensive survey, um, so that the consultants or the agency um, representatives can go out and really focus on what they know they need to focus on and not spend a whole lot of time, you know, making sure that the thing next door is related. Um, these are typically undertaken by federal and state agencies or local governments and are completed by consultants. As Jenny noted, you see an individual property form on the left. It is not uncommon for these evaluations um, within intensive level surveys to be anywhere between, I would say, 8 and 15 pages of evaluation on a given property. Um, so as when we talk about utility of something like an intensive level survey, it gives you a lot of information about a property in question. It also tells you whether or not recommendations have been made for local and or national designation. Um, so if you are on an HPC or a city staff person, being able to see the recommendations made on an intensive level survey give you a lot of information for your internal planning and evaluation for local designation. And then if you are an advocacy organization or a property owner or a potential property owner, these intensive survey forms give you a lot of background and history about the property that you own or are advocating for. Um, a property evaluation is a Minnesota specific document um, and they are most of a nomination except they're not on the federal form. So these are basically intensive surveys for individual properties. Um, this also provides the context and analysis of significance and integrity, typically in relation or always in relation to the National Register criteria. They provide the full building descriptions and make a recommendation for eligibility. If the SHPO concurs with the recommendation, the property is considered eligible for listing. Um, we typically see these through uh, the legacy grant program. So nonprofit or public entities are typically the ones that come in and ask for a property to be evaluated. And they're cons uh, completed by consultants. They can be done by an individual. Um, our office is happy to help. The National Register staff is happy to help individual property owners who are interested in evaluating their property. Um, this is a good first step because it doesn't require all of the sort of the fussy technical um, stuff that the National Register nominations do. I mean, the National Register program is a federal program in a federal form and comes with those complications. Local designation studies are used by municipalities and heritage preservation commissions to evaluate local resources against local designation criteria. 
So if you're a certified local government, for example, you have an ordinance that includes preservation registration criteria against which either your city staff or often a consultant would evaluate a given property or potential district against to determine whether or not you have a local resource. Local designation studies are incredibly important because local designation provides the most protection for historic resources that's available. This is often an area of confusion. National register designation, while incredibly important in the scope of federal protections, does not automatically come with design review and restrictions on private property. Local designation, however, does often come with design review in order to protect character defining elements of a property or character defining elements of a district so that we can understand the history of very often in this instance, our built form. Um, the designation study makes recommendations against whether or not something is eligible for local designation and also outlines through a very specific and detailed description of the property, what the historic elements and the character, what we call character defining elements of the property are so that they can be protected. So the, the third step in the preservation planning process is the registration, which is the actual formal listing of the property at the state, um, local or national level. In Minnesota, listing at the state level requires an act of legislature, and it's not really very common, so we're not really going to discuss it in detail here. Um, that information is readily available, and if you contact me later, I'll be happy to let you know if your property is locate, uh, is registered at the state level. Um, so in my work at the SHPO, uh, whether or not a, a building is eligible or a resource is eligible for listing at the National Register is the crucial, it's the hook. Mm -hmm. um, it's the crucial piece of information that we need to know about uh, so that we can determine whether or not the financial incentives are available, whether or not the regulatory, um, the regulatory work is necessary. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Protection. Protections. Thank you. Um, yep. So, the National Register nomination. The National Register is the official list of properties significant in American history, architecture, archaeology, engineering, and culture. It was established by the National Register, uh, the National Preservation Act of 1966, as part of a national program to coordinate and support public and private efforts to identify, evaluate, and consider historic um, resources. So it was written to guide federal undertakings, but for better or worse, it has become the prerequisite for many local and other federal programs, um, like property evaluations and inventory, uh, intensive surveys. Nominations provide context and analysis of significance in relation to National Register criteria for evaluation. They include full building descriptions with integrity analysis and make recommendations for eligibility. They are reviewed multiple times by the State Historic Preservation Office. They get, then go to the State Historic Preservation Review Board for further review and finally on to the National Park Service for review. And we would hope at that point listing, although sometimes they do have questions. Um, these documents are often thought of as stagnant, but we would like to tell you as National Register staff that we love to see a updates to these documents. Uh, we often will find new contexts um, that are applicable to buildings and getting that documentation formalized in the National Register nomination is incredibly important to understanding all of the aspects of history um, that our properties are associated with. Um, we, so there, don't think of them as stagnant. Um, however, they, they do tend to be your, um, the official document that people are going to look at. So the uh, the federal agencies, the regulatory agencies, the State Historic Preservation Office are not going to ask you what we know about the building. We're going to ask you what's in the National Register nomination. So the more thorough that document can be, the better. Um, if you have an older one, updating it is great. If you are working on a new one, um, then we're going to be hard and we're going to ask you lots of questions so that we can truly understand the significance of your property. I just saw a comment come up from Mary Warner, and she basically took the words right out of my mouth, which is that in preparing National Register nominations today, I jokingly refer to them as a quick master's thesis, but they're often, you know, and I'm using page counts to kind of give you an idea, but it's not uncommon to see them be 80 plus pages. 
um, early nominations, particularly those from the 1970s, 1980s, probably through like 1995, they're a little skinnier. Um, a lot of work was done in Minnesota in the 1980s in particular, and those nominations can nominate an entire property in a page, <laughs> maybe two. Um, they provide a very brief building description and very little contextual history. This is really important because as Jenny said, often when you're utilizing financial incentives for the reactivation or restoration of properties, the National Register nomination is the only tool that some review parties, some review agencies are going to use to understand your property. They may never come to see your farmstead or your building or your park. They'll only understand the property through the written documentation of the National Register nomination. So as Jenny noted, updating these documents, particularly older ones, is incredibly important because they are they are the property, <laughs> the way that many agencies are able to understand the property. And it's very hard to do that in a page or less. And we do still work regularly with um, private property owners to write National Register nominations. It's a little bit of a, you know, a DIY. So it's a do-it-yourself project. Uh, if you're not a professional in this, it's going to take a little bit longer, but the State Historic Preservation Office and National Register staff are more than willing to help you with this. Um, they help me. <laughs> <laughs> and, when, and when you, it's what we do. And if you want to hire a consultant or and can through the Legacy Grant Program, or it's part of a, a larger undertaking for the rehabilitation of a, of a property, we're still here. It's what we do. And we love it because uh, we're nerds. <laughs> I'm going to very quickly discuss the landmark local landmark designation. As I noted at the local landmark designation study um, slide, that landmark designation at the local level provides the most rigorous protections for historic properties. Um, I often explain them as landmark designation at the local level as having the teeth. Um, it comes with protections and design review, um, and it also highlights historic properties and very often historic districts that mean a lot to the local community but may not be eligible those properties may not be eligible for national register designation so they local landmark designation is able to tell really important stories and share really important narratives at the local level the designation as you see here with a local landmark historic district um, often covers city blocks, um, districts in particular are really common, I think, at the local level because you're able to understand your downtown or you're able to understand specific residential development through a number of properties versus an individual building or park. Um, the local landmark designation takes place at the local level. If you're a certified local government, um, very often the State Historic Preservation Office will review your local landmark designation application um, and recommend whether or not they concur with the findings. So now that we've identified and registered our historic properties, we need to understand how to care for them and steward them long term. And that's where treatment comes into play. There are very specific types of preservation planning documents that provide guidance on treatment, and they have a relatively long shelf life. I like to think of them as sort of user manuals for your historic property. A historic structure report is, as it sounds, a document that provides a history and treatment recommendations for a historic structure. So in this case, something built. It may be a building, but very often it's a water tower or a fire tower, as Jenny said. It is something that has been usually constructed above ground. Um, a historic structure report provides a very detailed history of a property, an evaluation of its significance, a timeline of development and use of the property, which means that, say, if we're talking about a library, it will document who the librarian was during a given time period, as well as all capital improvements and changes to operating structure um, that take place within that building. So it talks about both the structure itself and the activities that took place within or around the property. In addition, it provides an evaluation of current conditions, and it tells you what 
needs to be repaired, what has been removed from the property, what is a non-historic material, and it makes recommendations for treatment. So it will provide long-term guidance for how to maintain, repair, and rehabilitate your property. A historic structure report has an incredibly long shelf life. It provides those recommendations on a one to two year level, a three to five year level, and a 10 plus year level for improvements and repair. The really common when we have an older National Register nomination because the history provided in the historic structure report fills in the blanks that are left when we have just a couple of pages of documentation about the history of a property. When the state historic, oh, yeah. oops, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. State historic Preservation Office reviews HSRs either because they're written um, through one of our programs or um, because we're using them. We often will, we like it when the history uh, section is written in such a way that we can just drag and drop it into the National Register update. So if your historic structures report doesn't answer all those questions, um, if your National Register nomination doesn't answer all those questions about what are the character defining features and what's the period of significance and why a property is significant, then the HSR will. Um, and if it doesn't on its first draft, it will by the time we're done. Indeed. <laughs> um, a cultural landscape report is much like a historic structure report, except that it is for cultural landscapes. Cultural landscapes can be parks, they can be farmsteads. Here you see Glen Sheen, which is a large property that includes both a house and landscape elements. Cultural landscapes are incredibly important because they provide treatment recommendations for built, designed, natural forms. They account for change in a way that a historic structure report may not. Um, landscapes that are designed landscapes and include vegetation by their very nature grow and adapt and adapt and change over time. And a cultural landscape report acknowledges and accommodates for that change in its recommendations. Um, much like an HSR, these are incredibly valuable user manuals for your historic property and landscape. In they also help, thank you. They also yeah. help um, when, when we're, when the SHPO, and I can't speak uh, as a design reviewer, I am not a design reviewer, but when these, when treatment options come in, when designs come in, having an HSR or a CLR on file that we can reference is gonna help preempt a lot of questions we're gonna have. So having those thorough documents, those user manuals um, ready to go and ready to support whatever decisions, uh, treatment decisions you're making is gonna, is gonna be really helpful. And cut down your review time. A conditions assessment is what it sounds like. It is a document that evaluates the existing conditions of your historic property and makes recommendations for repair and treatment. Unlike an HSR, the condition assessment does not include a robust evaluation of historic significance and a documentation of the evolution of a building over time. It really is more of a snapshot of current conditions and recommendations for repair. Um, it is it is a smaller document and it is more often used and commissioned when a robust National Register nomination exists because then that history and the evaluation of what materials are historic is already documented somewhere else. Design guidelines are available are produced at the local level when we have designated a local landmark um, through the local landmark designation process that we discussed before. Design guidelines are incredibly important. They're often prepared by city staff um, to guide the change within a historic property or district. They serve as tool guide, tools for property owners to understand how to undertake change on their property while maintaining landmark designation. Um, and they serve as guidelines for city staff and HPCs when they're reviewing design applications for historic properties. For example, if you want to repair your windows, design guidelines will often provide a high level instructions on how to do so. And if you have to replace a window because it's deteriorated, the design guidelines will make recommendations on what the best replacement or new window type should be. So they really do provide a lot of valuable information to both a property owner and city staff. 
And with that, we finally got through all of the preservation planning documents, and we wanted to briefly discuss some case studies and still leave room for questions. We felt case studies were incredibly important in the conversation today because they show how these preservation planning tools result in the reactivation of historic space and buildings. Our first case study is PV Plaza in Minneapolis, which shows how preservation planning tools were used in a state compliance project. PV Plaza was constructed in 1975, and as you can see here, it was a terraced, it is a terraced um, modern concrete city civic plaza and landscaped area. Um, over time, the water features at PV Plaza stopped functioning. The fountains um, were not operable because the plumbing in the underground had been broken. Um, and because the plaza was constructed in 1975 and is composed of a number of terraces, it was not ADA accessible. And the city of Minneapolis, which owns and operates the plaza, really felt that it was important that all of its residents would be able to use the plaza. PV Plaza was listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 2011. Pardon me for not knowing that right off the top of my head. And the documentation was incredibly thorough, and it explained both the significance of PV Plaza, the character defining elements and materials, and really clearly articulated what was important about this place, both at a national level and within the city of Minneapolis. This guided the treatment recommendations in the historic structure report that the city of Minneapolis commissioned, and which was prepared by Miller Dunwoody, Damon Farber, and Hess Royce, all historic consultants and architects and landscape architects. The historic structure report made very clear recommendations on how to repair the historic concrete at the plaza, how to sensitively add ADA accessible ramps to the plaza and how to reactivate the space for 21st century users. The historic structure report then allowed the design team that led the reactivation of PV Plaza, uh, which was led by Cohen and Partners and which full disclosure, my firm New History worked on, um, in making decisions with the city of Minneapolis and project stakeholders on how best to activate the plaza, repair historic materials and provide ADA accessibility and improve both the function and the environmental sustainability of the water features. Um, PV used to lose about 100,000 gallons of water um, a week, I believe. And so by adding some new fountain features and new working with a fountain consultant, we were able to dramatically reduce the water usage um, within the plaza. And so through the National Register document and the HSR, we were also able to, and, and Sarah is on, the, <laughs> is on the call today, Sarah's team at the State Historic Preservation Office was able to review the impacts of the proposed design changes at PV Plaza through the lens of the Historic Structure Report and the National Register nomination. And as a result, we have a, re a pixelated picture, my apologies, um, a reactivated plaza that is fully accessible um, People who have limited mobility or limited sight are able to access all elements of the plaza. And we have water features that are once again operational for the first time in well over a decade. And people can enjoy the plaza. Um, you see children running through it now because we have just a scrim of water. And it's been a remarkably successful project. Our next case study is the Fort Snelling Visitor Center, which is currently under construction at Fort Snelling here in Minnesota. And this shows how planning tools were essential in a successful state and federal compliance project. Fort Snelling is a national historic landmark. It is listed in the National Register of Historic Places, and it has incredible, incredible sacred importance to the Dakota people and other Native American tribes here in Minnesota. It's an incredibly complex site that has both been a military fort and a site of internment and incarceration and massacre. So it has really complex and varied histories and it plays, it has incredible significance and importance to a wide variety of stakeholders. The Minnesota Historical Society operates Fort Snelling and over the past few years, they've been planning for a new visitor center and a new visitor experience at the fort. And the plan has been to reactivate a 1907 barracks, which you see here in 1909, as a visitor center and to rehabilitate the landscape to 
tell more diverse stories, including Native American and Dakota stories specifically, and to do some prairie restoration. This project would not have been possible, frankly, without very specific preservation planning documents. As I noted, Fort Snelling is listed in the National Register of Historic Places, and it's a National Historic Landmark. Um, the documentation for that property is being updated um, by the State Historic Preservation Office in consultation with stakeholders to acknowledge both the Native American significance and I think broaden the architectural and archeological significance of the site. Um, historic Fort Snelling is also, Fort Snelling is also a complete all of it is a, an active archaeological site. And so when we undertake projects at this property, we have to be really sensitive to both above ground, underground, and um, traditional cultural resources. To that end, we had two treatment documents that were prepared to inform the project, both a historic structure report for the barracks buildings and a cultural landscape report for the greater Fort Snelling landscape. Um, the cultural landscape report in particular was incredibly important because it provided a lot of information about the development of the landscape at Fort Snelling over time from um, including pre-European contact landscape development as well as the impact that the United States military had on those landscape forms. Um, both of these documents guided the rehabilitation design and the review of this project um, by the State Historic Preservation Office and the National Park Service and resulted in a project that is currently being constructed that will have a new visitor experience at Fort Snelling, including a visitor center in a former Calvary barracks, um, as well as really incredible landscape design that provides narrative um, materials and interpretive materials to tell a more diverse story at Fort Snelling that both includes the military history, which the fort is known for, but also expands on that history to provide much more context into the Native American history of the site. Our final case study is the Hope Engine Company number three in St. Paul, which shows how planning tools benefited a historic rehabilitation tax credit project. Hope Engine Company number three is the oldest extant fire station in the city of St. Paul. It was constructed in the 1870s. The city of St. Paul decommissioned the fire station in the 1960s, at which time the station was acquired by a private owner, um, a, a local contracting firm, who used the building as storage. Um, using the building as storage, frankly, was a great use um, from the perspective of historic material retention because the building wasn't changed at the interior at all over the past 40 years. Um, however, there was extensive change at the exterior and additions surrounded this fire station to the point that the, the building appeared um, to encompass a full city block. And when the fire station was acquired by a private developer, it was in some ways difficult to see that a historic fire station was buried within all of this additional construction. Um, the city of St. Paul at the same time was evaluating all of its historic fire stations um, or all of its older fire stations. And it was aware that it was going to be decommissioning some of those properties and probably selling them to proper, private property owners. So they undertook a historic context of historic fire stations in St. Paul, and that historic context provided a deep and robust history of how the St. Paul Fire Department developed over time and evaluated all of the fire stations that were extant in the city um, within the time period of the context for both local and national register eligibility. That evaluation was a historic resulted in a historic resource survey that proved incredibly valuable because it recommended the Hope Engine Company number three as both locally and nationally eligible or nationally significant. This resulted in the preparation of a National Register of Historic Places nomination. Um, full disclosure, I prepared that nomination and I couldn't have done so without the guidance and collaboration of Dennis Gardner at the Minnesota SHPO, as Jenny said, the State Historic Preservation Office is an incredible partner in the preparation of these documents um, well beyond their review obligations. The National Register nomination positioned this project for state and financial, state and federal tax incentives um, through the Historic Rehabilitation Tax Credit Program. Without those rehabilitation tax incentives, this property, because of its size and the cost of rehabilitating the project, wouldn't have been possible to rehabilitate. 
So the Hope Engine Company number three is now the Hope Breakfast Bar, which is an incredibly popular restaurant that through the recent COVID-19 crisis has also served as a food bank for residents of the city of St. Paul. And as I said, prop these projects, all three of them, but I, I would say this one in particular um, would not have been possible if the historic preservation planning documents that we talked about today hadn't been undertaken um, because they saved a lot of time, they provide a, provided a lot of insight into what materials needed to be repaired and retained, and they gave the State Historic Preservation Office guidance on how to review each of these projects. Ginny? <laughs> Thanks, Tamara. Yeah, the, the thing we want you to walk away with is um, preservation planning is, um, is not an easy thing to undertake. It takes uh, a lot of a lot of work and it requires a lot of information, but to use these documents in a proactive way is going to ultimately save uh, the time and energy when it comes to projects, whether or not you know they're coming, um, like, you know, potential historic preservation tax credits in a district or whether or not, you know, you don't know they're coming, like, you know, disaster, um, d disaster recovery. So please think of these as a long-term investment in your historic properties. Um, thank you. We have about four minutes for questions. I am willing to stick around a little bit longer if Tamara is as well, if people still have uh, still have questions. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny and Tamara. Excellent presentation. I only have a couple questions in the Q&A, so people, if you have questions, get them in now, and we can try to fit a few in. So Mary asks, where can intensive surveys or property evaluations be found by researchers or the public? So those are actually found in the State Historic Preservation Office files. Uh, we have them. You can contact either me directly or our um, inventory manager, Jim Krumrai, um, through a data request, and we can take a look at those for you and get them scanned and out to you. We're working very diligently to get them digitally available, but right now they're in the office and file folders. I would add to that that um, a lot of the context studies that are, have been written, um, particularly in the past five years or so, are often digitally available um, through the very often the city that commissioned. Yeah, thank you. Mary also asks, if you have a landscape with a building, do you need to create both a, both a historic structures report and cultural landscape report? Or can you just have a cultural landscape report with a building as part of it? You can absolutely just have a cultural landscape report with a building as part of it. That's an excellent question, Mary. Um, which, which it, yeah, go ahead, Tamara. I was going to say, say, for example, the Fort Snelling cultural landscape yeah. report does mention the buildings and there's some overlap there. Yeah. Yes, and there's some overlap there. Um, I like to think of, you know, a fairgrounds, for example, as a cultural landscape. And that would be a situation where you have a number of built structures and I would evaluate them as part of the CLR. Uh, Marjorie also asks, similar to Mary's first question, can you provide an update on how the public can access SHPO reports and files? Jenny, you alluded to that, but maybe a little bit more generally. Sure. So um, the data practices, uh, sorry, the data request at SHPO um, email that is on our website is how you would, at this time during the pandemic, access those documents. Um, Jim Krumrai or um, another staff member when we're in the office can get those scanned and out to you. We do ask that you are patient with us. Um, staff is only allowed into the, uh, the actual office to access the files. Um, we have one staff member in one day a week. So we are working hard to, to respond to those and kind of doing all hands on deck. But if you contact Jim, um, then he will make sure that that is, that is done as quickly as possible. And I have a question from Andrea. After a context is developed, is there a typical or common number of properties which are expected to be determined eligible among all of those in the context? No. <laughs> that's, a math, that's a math problem for you, Jenny. Yes, it's a, it's a math problem. So a context <laughs> will provide the documentation for comparative analysis. So uh, a property needs to be uh, to be outstanding, to be significant when compared to other like properties within its context. So that can be local, regional, or um, national, statewide, national. Um, like the MPDF on banks, it tells you a context will give you the information to determine which of those 
banks is the most um, the most significant um, and how to tell that story. Sometimes multiple buildings can be significant if the contexts are different, right? So if you have one library building that is significant for its early 20th century architecture and you have one library building that's significant for its mid-century architecture, you have an architectural context on libraries in your town that actually has two that are significant. Um, you could end up with uh, a library that is part of a larger um, community district, you know, a civic district that is eligible because it is in Congress with things around it. Um, a context does not intentionally limit the or promote the number of properties that will be eligible. What it will do is give the preparer of those documentations sufficient information to argue for eligibility. Does As an example, I just recently completed a context for the city of Minneapolis that is Minneapolis in the modern era, 1930 to 1975. And it covers 45 years of, of city history. Um, and some of that is architecturally specific, and a lot of it is about social developments and political developments and the impact of the war on the city. And it intentionally does not have a robust list of properties to recommend because that could be thousands of properties. Um, what it does is provide the, I hate to say context, but I mean, that's why it's called the context. It provides a framework for evaluation. And and I jokingly say as a consultant, then like my my job is to make that work for whatever the property is that I'm looking at. Um, I like to think that every property is eligible, as Jenny would tell you. <laughs> you just have to find the right story. Um, Jenny would disagree with me, but that's why we have different jobs. <laughs> I would encourage. I would encourage a creative and out of the box thinking when it comes to eligibility. But yeah, not quite as many as Tamara likes to think is eligible. Yes, yeah. it's good to be positive and open minded. Yes, and so like the buildings. Yeah, it's 11.02. I have one more question, it looks like, unless anyone's want to squeeze one in. But Ethan asks, do you have any experiences where public engagement has significantly changed? Oops, I'm sorry, it just, here we go. It, it like moved on me while I was reading it. Um, do you have any experiences where public engagement has significantly changed the context of a site or added another layer of history that wasn't captured in any context study or nomination form? Tamara, I'm going to punt that one to you. I don't, I don't do a lot of community engagement. Yeah, I would say, you know, my experience, um, the contexts that I've worked on, you know, not necessarily. Um, that being said, we've we've talked about some contexts here, um, such as the. African American context in the city of St. Paul, um, where certainly community engagement absolutely informed the direction that that context took and what was included within it. Um, I, I would say that similarly, while not a context, um, I know that um, Quinn Evans Architects, um, which prepared the cultural landscape um, report for Fort Snelling, um, depended heavily on community engagement to inform the historic narrative in that report. And and it I don't want to speak for that team, but I, I know that the community engagement was incredibly valuable to the ultimate event that was that was prepared and, and the information that was included therein. And I can say from uh, in answering Ethan's question from an environmental review perspective, that certainly is it has happened and it's an important part of the section 106 process is when um, when uh, an evaluation of a historic property or archaeological archaeological historic structure is done as part of a 106 review that the federal agency shares that with the public and other consulting parties there have been instances where consulting party or the public um, say well you really missed this part of the story or and tribal consultation has done the same thing, and that's why that process is so important to engage those other parties. Um, and it's not just SHPO looking at it um, to bring in other layers of significance that may have been missed by the by that 
consultant who's evaluating it at all. We don't want it to work in a vacuum. We want people to provide their input. So that definitely happens in the 106 process. I mean, we don't know. Right? So that was really garbly. Um, as a historian, and, and I can speak to you know my training, I am dependent on what's available in an archive. And often what gets saved in an archive is is incredibly biased. Like you have to decide that you want your stuff in an archive <laughs> and that you know we are we are really dependent on what gets saved. And so without community engagement, I can't know what what other people know. I can't know what somebody might have in their own, you know, in their basement or in their attic, which informs the story. I can't know oral traditions and stories that have been passed down if they're not documented somewhere in an archive for me to access. And so, as Sarah said, like, without community engagement, I only know what I can research and word search in, in newspapers and in an archival holdings. And when, when your report is passed along to our office, we can only rely on what is given to us through the federal agency. So right. um, it's not that we're ignoring what other stories might be out there, but that's the beautiful part of the regulations. As Tamara knows, we love we love the regulations mm -hmm. um, and that, that they do uh, require the agencies to go out and present this information on a broader scale than just to show. So we are mm -hmm. at 1106. I don't see any questions. Um, Mike or John, any final wrap ups here? Thank you everybody for joining us. Yeah, it, it does look like we have one more question that came in through chat. Um, okay. If you guys don't mind, um, Molly Patterson Lundgren would like to know um, more about the Hope Fire Station, which documents were used to support the removal of non-significant additions for the reuse project? Excellent question, Molly. Um, the, the great news is that we were able to use both the, the building description um, from, from the survey documentation, as well as just our own site observations. Um, when, when you go inside the fire station, the exterior walls are very clear um, and it's, it's mass masonry brick construction. So it, it was easy to identify where the building ended. Um, when you were inside the the additions um and then i would say what was really what contributed to the deep understanding of of what to repair and restore at the interior was that the fire department in st paul kept a century's worth of records including all of their capital expenditures so you know we and, and i think that's an important note with with surveys intensive and recon, we don't go inside buildings. We, we really are still doing an exterior snapshot 90% of the time. Um, so it was the National Register nomination and, and the research that we conducted for that that really explained what was historic at the interior and what needed to be retained because we could do sort of that next level of deep research um, on changes to the structure. Does that answer your question? I guess you have to check it in at me if it doesn't. I'm sure she's nodding. I know. Also, she has my number. Molly, you can call me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both. And I don't think there's anything. Anything else here. Thanks everybody for joining us. I'm going a little bit over Thanks 11. Us, we have two more sessions next week. Um, if you haven't signed up. Register uh, for the final two sessions. I think the, uh, the final one next Thursday is still TBD, but. I think there'll be an announcement soon about what that uh, will entail. Bye, y'all. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.